Super Mario Flash was a very popular Flash-based Mario fan game, which was made in 2007. It includes a level editor, which allows players to share their creations by copying a code that can be shared and pasted back into the game to load stages. The codes, which store everything the game needs to reconstruct a level, can be manually manipulated in order to cause things to happen that are not normally possible within the editor itself. This video will cover how the level codes work and what can be achieved by modifying them. Alright, first of all, I'll be using version 3.0 of Super Mario Flash in this video, since it's the last official version of the game. However, practically all the information here will carry over to previous versions of the game too, and mods such as version E. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Before we get started analyzing the codes, we have to understand a little bit about how levels are structured within the game. A level is basically stored as two grids, one representing the main area and the other representing the bonus stage. The grid's heights are 12 tiles, and their widths are 225 tiles. Even if a level is shorter than 225 tiles, the game stores tiles all the way to 225 anyway, they're just never seen or used. Every block or enemy occupies exactly one tile on the grid. Internally, the game stores the contents of these grids as numbers that represent every type of block or enemy with a unique identifying code. For example, the code 1 represents a grass tile, and the code 61 represents a Goomba. A code of 0 means that a spot on the grid is unoccupied. Okay, now we're ready to look at an example level code. The code is composed of four lists, which are each contained within parentheses and have their contents separated by commas. List 1 contains the codes for all the tiles in the main area, and list 2 contains the codes for all the tiles in the bonus area. We'll get to lists 3 and 4 later. When the game is generating a code and is copying a grid of tile numbers into list 1 or 2, it starts copying at the top left and goes from the left to right and then top to bottom. Just to be clear, it actually goes all the way across the entire width of the 225 tile grid, but I've used a shortened grid here to make a more understandable visual. The game doesn't put any separators in between the rows, it's all just strung together in one big list. When the game is loading a code, it has to split the list back out into 12 equal pieces to get the different rows. Pretty straightforward. Okay, I lied. The tile grids aren't actually the only things that are stored in lists 1 and 2. Right after the tile list, they both have an additional 6 values strung onto the end that contain some extra information about the level. I'll be referring to these values as the level data. This is an example of some level data from list 1, the main stage. For convenience, I'll refer to the numbers in the level data as value A through value F and assign them different colors. The first one, value A, represents something different in the main area and the bonus area. In the main area, as shown here, it represents the name of the level, which is shown on the level start screen. In the bonus area's code, value A indicates whether the player starts in the main area or the bonus area. It only has two values that are accepted by the game, which are level and bonus. If you set it to something besides those two, then the game won't know where to put Mario when you start the level, and he'll just instantly fall to his death in a black void. Moving on, value B. Value B works the same in both the main area and the bonus area. It's a number from 1 to 6, and it indicates what background will be used. 1 means a land level, 2 means a cave level, 3 means a forest level, 4 means a castle level, 5 means a snow level, and 6 means a ghost level. Pretty simple. In this example, it's a 3, so the background will be a forest level. If you set it to something that's not a number from 1 to 6, then the game will glitch and Mario will just die in the void again. Now onto values C and D. Values C and D represent the coordinates where the player spawns when they start the level. These are measured in units and not tiles. Every tile equals about 20 units. Anyway, value C is the x-axis, starting from the left, and value D is the y-axis, starting from the top. Although both the main area and the bonus area have starting coordinates, the only ones that are used are the ones for the zone you start on. If you start in the main area, and then it uses the main area's starting coordinates. But if you start in the bonus area, it uses the bonus area's starting coordinates. Either way, one of them goes unused. Now value E. Value E tells the game what music to play in the respective area. The numbers 1 through 11 all have a music sound that's assigned to play. If you manually change it to anything else, then no music will play when you start the level. In addition to the music that can be picked in the editor, there are three background music tracks that are normally unusable. By manually changing value E to 9, 10, or 11, you can get the Starman music, the level completed music, or the boss completed music. 
They're all pretty annoying looped as background music, which is probably why they weren't included for use in the editor. Now for the last one, value f. Value f is the width of the level in units. In this example, the level is at the maximum possible size, 225 tiles. Since there are 20 units in a tile, that means that the level is 4,500 units long, and that's exactly what you see here. Like I said earlier, the levels are stored as being 225 tiles wide, even if the level is actually shorter. This value, stored in value f, just indicates where the game should stop scrolling. If you manually modify the level length to go past 225 tiles, the level will actually keep going longer than normal. Although the game still doesn't store any tiles there, so it's just totally empty. The level editor doesn't actually have the functionality to change the width of a level once you start making it. But if you decide that you want it longer or shorter, you can just change value f manually in order to adjust the length. Interestingly, even though you can't see past the edge of the stage, the next couple tiles past the edge are still loaded. This means that if you edit the code so that there are enemies just past the end of the level, they can just show up, walking in from off screen. There probably aren't any practical uses for that though. Now I think I've explained everything relating to lists 1 and 2. Now I'll explain lists 3 and 4. These ones are a lot simpler. These values have to do with warps, meaning warp pipes and doors. On older versions of Super Mario Flash, which don't have warps, lists 3 and 4 don't exist. They only had list 1, since they only had the main stage and no bonus area. Anyway, the way the warps work is pretty simple. There are 6 types of warp entrances, the 4 cardinal directions for pipes, and 2 types of doors. Every type of warp entrance is made up of 2 tiles on the main grid marking it. Although these tiles are invisible for pipe entrances, the door entrance tiles double as creating the visuals for the door itself. The entrance tiles in the map are enough to let the player enter the warp, but unless they have corresponding data in lists 3 and 4, the game will just softlock when you enter them. You're probably wondering what lists 3 and 4 contain exactly, so let's take a look. List 3 is a list of all the warps with their entrances in the main area, and list 4 is a list of all the warps with their entrances in the bonus area. In this example, there are no warps in the bonus area, so list 4 is empty. We'll just focus on list 3 for now. Every warp has 7 attributes that are stored in the list. This example of list 3 only has 1 warp, so it's only 7 items long. Like I did with the level data, I'll be assigning the different values different letters and colors, but don't worry, it'll go a lot faster this time. Values A and B represent the coordinates of the warp entrance, measured in tiles. Value C represents whether the warp will take you to the main area or the bonus area. In this example, it takes you to the bonus area. If it took you to the main area, it would say level instead. Values D and E represent the coordinates where the warp puts you out. These are measured in units, not tiles. Value F indicates whether the player is facing left or right when they come out of the warp. In this example, he'll come out of the warp facing to the right. And now the last one, value G. Value G tells how the player comes out of the warp. There are five different values this can be. If it's a direction, left, right, up, or down, then Mario plays the animation of coming out of a pipe in that direction. Alternatively, value G can be the word appear, which means Mario instantly appears at the destination without the pipe animation. Now you may be wondering, what happens when you have more than one warp? In this example, there's only one, so the seven values for it make up the entirety of the list. Well, the way it works is pretty simple. When you have additional warps, it just strings all the warps together, one after the other. When the game is loading the code, it splits the list out into groups of seven and treats them all separately. Well, there you have it. All you need to know about how the Super Mario Flash level codes work. We can check that off the video topic checklist. Now, using what we just learned, we can try out some interesting things that you can do by modifying the code that can't be achieved using the official level editor. Let's go. One of the most obvious things you can do is change the individual tiles. There are some blocks that can't normally be placed individually. For example, the game treats the flagpole like a single object, even though it's made up of several individual tiles. By editing the code manually, you can place the different parts of the flag wherever you want, and you can make stuff like this. Maybe there's a reason they don't let you do that. Here's another example. The bottom of the flagpole is normally always colored brown, which is the normal color for blocks and overworld levels. But in underground levels, it looks a little bit out of place. To fix this, you can edit the code to swap out the bottom block of the flagpole with a blue block. Now it looks fine. 
In addition to moving the regular tiles around, there's also a few tiles that aren't normally placeable in the game at all. First off is an instant win tile, which appears invisible, but when the player touches it, they instantly win the level. This can be used as an alternative to getting the flagpole. Another block that doesn't normally exist in regular levels is called the Inviso Tile. The codes 6 and 15 create totally invisible solid blocks, which act as solid tiles but can't be seen. Inviso Tiles were generally frowned upon in the Super Mario Flash community due to their frequent use in troll levels. Anyway, another thing that can be useful is removing the tiles for the player's starting location. The game doesn't actually need these since it uses the level data to decide where the player begins the level. All the start tiles do is prevent you from placing blocks over the level entrance. However, there are some cases when you may want to place blocks over the starting area. What if you want the player to start out coming out of a castle? All you have to do is delete the start tiles from the code, and then you can edit the area normally while still spawning in the correct spot. Similarly, warp exit tiles are completely non-functional tiles that only prevent you from placing blocks. You can delete them without affecting gameplay at all. This leaves room to put things there, such as piranha plants, which isn't normally possible. You can also place piranha plants inside warp pipe entrances too, but it's a little different. For warp pipe entrances, only one of the two entrance tiles is needed for the warp to function. Both of them individually tell the game that there's a warp there, so you can delete either one in order to place something else on top of the pipe, such as a piranha plant, but you can't delete both of them or else the warp won't work. And now for a slightly more complicated possibility. Like I said earlier, warp pipe exit tiles don't actually have any functionality, so you can erase them from the code to make room for something else. You can exploit this to create two-way warps, but it's a little difficult. For a two-way warp to exist, you have to have warp entrance tiles over both of the pipes, as well as corresponding warp data in lists 3 or 4 that tell each of these warps to take the player to the other pipe. Filling in the values manually can be time-consuming, so to avoid it, here's the method to create two-way warps that I've found most convenient. First, build the two warp pipes and create a warp from one to the other using the in-game editor. Then copy the code and delete both the warp entrance tiles and the warp exit tiles. Then load it back into the editor and create another warp that goes in the opposite direction from the first one you made. Then save the code again and replace the warp exit tiles with warp entrance tiles. Load it back into the game and ta-da, you have a two-way warp, a normally impossible feature in Super Mario Flash. That's basically all there is to know regarding tiles and tile editing, but that's not all there is to do. There are a few neat effects that you can get from modifying the level data. I've already shown a little bit of this, such as the Black Void of Death and the extra music tracks that you can't normally pick, but there's just a couple more things I'd like to tell you about. First off, Super Mario Flash has a physics mechanic where if Mario glitches inside a block and tries to walk, the game gives him a lot of speed, a level of speed which can't normally be reached. There are some levels, such as hold right and up levels, which change the player's starting coordinates to place them exactly between two blocks so that they can maintain hyperspeed throughout the entire stage. Another cool thing you can mess around with is Mario's direction when you come out of a pipe or a door. Normally, all types of warps result in Mario facing to the right when he comes out, with the exception of leftward facing pipes. But you can just swap out the value in the warp data, say left instead of right, and the player will come out facing the opposite direction. You can also set the direction to some other random value besides left and right, which will result in the player's animation getting all glitched up after coming out of the warp. It goes back to normal after they start walking though. And now, one final trick. This one's pretty useless, but still kind of cool. It requires you to start the level in the main area and set the bonus area's background to an invalid number. Then take the warp from the main area to the bonus area. The warp will take you to the same coordinates that it would have taken you to in the bonus area, but the currently loaded area doesn't actually switch. Since the background is invalid in the bonus area, it just stays in the main area. But that's not all. Now the enemies and moving objects that were on screen when you entered the warp will get frozen in place and can't hurt Mario. This might sound a little bit confusing, so I'll just show you a video of what happens. What's going on here? Okay, so when the player enters a warp or exits a pipe, there's a brief animation period where all the enemies and moving objects in the level get frozen in place. Now, when the warp tries to take you to the bonus area with the invalid background, it isn't able to successfully load the new area. Since it never switches over, it never turns off the frozen entities effect, so time is just stopped for the enemies that are on screen. Well, that's all I have to say regarding Super Mario Flash code editing. Let's check off that second checkbox. 
In the description, I have included a link to a list of all the tile codes and what blocks they stand for, in case anyone watching this wants to mess around with Super Mario Flash code editing for themselves. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.